Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specialises in campaigning and community organising. We work with non-profit and community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. Dunn Street develops community engagement and organising strategies to win campaigns both big and small and we train engagement staff, volunteers and organisers in leadership and power building. And if you want to create change in your community in 2023 then hit us up at dunstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. When you need support with your legal issue, it can feel pretty daunting. And that's why for over 100 years, Morris Blackburn has been helping guide clients with their legal needs. They're here to help you when you need them the most. From workplace to medical injuries, class actions, occupational diseases, and wills and estates planning. And as Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, they have the local knowledge and the national network with the experience that you can, you can count on. Uh, to find out more, visit them at their website, which is morrisblackburn.com.au. And finally, today's episode is brought to you by Swift Fox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust, lists that are up to date, phone banks that can change minds, emails that drive donations and events that will energise the community both online and offline and text blasts that distill your message perfectly. SwiftFox CRM is actually made for campaigners by campaigners. And to find out more, just go to their website, which is swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign. Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that's out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them both home and abroad. And this week we're tackling the housing crisis that is uh, causing consternation across uh, communities here in Australia. And to help me uh, work out where this crisis started, um, what were the factors that led to it, how did we get here and what are the solutions uh, on today's episode, I'm going to be joined by Rebecca Thistleton, who's the Executive Director from the uh, McCall Institute, Victoria, and uh, Matthew Lloyd Cape, who is from the Centre for Equitable Housing, which is a per capita initiative. Looking forward to hearing those two experts uh, on this hot topic. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher. And when you're done listening to the show, please give us five stars on the Apple Podcast app and uh, leave us a review as well. Uh, and for all the updates, follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we are taping this one on a Tuesday afternoon on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And uh, today's topic is the housing crisis and I've got two people on here who are going to help me solve it, starting with Rebecca Thistleton, who is the Executive Director for Macal Victoria. Um, Rebecca, welcome back to Socially Democratic. Thank you. And first time uh, uh, caller in or not sure if he's even listened to the podcast before, but uh, <laughs> no better way to start than just get on it, right? Uh, Matt Lloyd-Cape from the Centre for Equitable Housing, which is an initiative that's come out of per capita. Welcome to Socially Democratic. Thank you. Hi, Stephen. How are you going? Uh, excellent. Okay, housing. It's been uh, something that's come, uh, sort of, I guess it's been at the forefront of the debate in the media, certainly in the last sort of four or five months, but I feel like it's been an issue that's been hanging around for quite some time. Uh, so we thought it'd be time for us on uh, this podcast to turn our attention, have a bit of a chat about it. What I want to do is I kind of want to break it down in terms of what is the problem, what are the causes, and what are the impacts, and then what are the solutions? And let's step ourselves through that. Starting with, first of all, the, the problem, and I want to go to you, first of all, Rebecca Thistleton. Outline what do we mean by a housing crisis? What are the central housing issues that Australians face in 2023? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I think when we're talking about the housing crisis, it's something that uh, people that have got a real interest in this area have been um, warning about for quite some time. And uh, Matt, I know that that's something that uh, yourself uh, with Per Capita have been talking about and uh, and warning about too, that we're starting to get into this situation where we've got this perfect storm of problems building up with uh, interest rates going up, pressures in the rental market too, problems with um, housing being able to get underway from a 
uh, construction perspective as well. So many different factors that have just made housing incredibly expensive, whether it be people that are um, wanting to find a rental property, people that are wanting to buy a house, or people that already do own their own home, but are being hit really hard by rising interest rates. And it's something that we're seeing not just in the capital cities, but also spread out across the regions. Um, it's a problem that you know, countries around the world are really facing at the moment as well. Uh, but I, I think too, what really strikes me here in Australia is the, the fact that it is just being felt across the board at the moment. And it is a real shame that it's really taken us getting to this point where it is in crisis and we've got uh, you know, people that are lower income owners that are spending something like 50% of their income on their rent each week. Um, that that's it's taken that to get us to this point where it's uh, on the cover of every newspaper. People are talking about it so much. It's being discussed on FM radio. It's really um, at the forefront of everything that we're talking about at the moment. So I do think that it's a shame that we've had to get to this point where people are really feeling this pinch uh, as well as the cost of living. But hopefully that means we can start to see a real push for change. Excellent uh, openings uh, summary there, uh, Rebecca, outlining. So obviously people who want to buy a home, people who are renting and feeling the pressures there, and obviously people who currently own property and finding it challenging to um, have home security because of interest rates. Can I go to you, Matt? With respect to those who want to buy a home, is this a supply or a demand issue? Um, If only it were that simple, right? Like it's not one singular problem. And I think one of the things that we're really seeing at the moment is we've got a whole host of long-term generational kind of policy failures interacting with a really complex short-term set of circumstances. Mm. Like we lost half a million migrants um, in the pandemic and they've all come steaming back or most of them come steaming back and that's causing stress in the housing market just because of the speed of re-entry. And that's all re- inter- interacting with these long-term problems that we've been building up for generations like the decline in social housing and so on. So as far as like people that want to buy a house right now, um, we have seen house prices go down over the last year. So in Melbourne, house prices are around 7.5% lower this time now than last year. Um, and that's in large part due to the 12 rate rises from the RBA. Um, but that doesn't really resolve the problem for first time buyers because at the same time as prices are going down, listings have declined a lot. So listings are about 20% lower now than this time last year. So that's 45,000 fewer properties in the market for sale. It means it's harder to find that property that you want, the one that's close to your work or one that's close to childcare. Um, so there's less choice for people trying to buy right now. And added to this, we've had well, there's two other big points. One is that we've had a decade of zero wage growth, um, which has smashed people's um, purchasing affordability brackets. Um, but also people are being, when they go to the bank to get their mortgage, they're being stress tested at a far higher rate than we've seen for a decade now. So the ability for someone actually to get the mortgage on something they could have afforded two years ago, as a whole swathe of people that can't get that house anymore. So for recent home buyers as well, it's really hard going. Um, we've seen the RBA rate rises increase the typical mortgage repayment by about $1,250 a month. Um, on a, that's on a, like a 600K mortgage. So a really significant um, eating into people's disposable incomes. Let's turn to uh, the rental market. And if I can go to you, Rebecca, um, to, I, I assume it feels like a supply issue. I know that when I um, was, when I first left, you know, university or college and was trying to get a, a rental, property wasn't that difficult really to find somewhere particularly in an area that you wanted to to live but I get a sense now just anecdotally that you know the queues out the front of sought after rental properties in in a city Melbourne and Sydney and Brisbane and Adelaide um, are huge that people are paying over the 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 you know the market value to rent that place is that I mean what's going on in the rental market what are we seeing there yes I think It's really interesting in Victoria to see that in areas where we have uh, generally started, uh, generally seen a tighter rental market uh, in in the past, things have gone from tight to to really, really tight. And where where it has been generally uh, relatively easy to get a rental property, it's become really tight there as well. So it's it's spread out everywhere to the point where you've got students that would normally, uh, as, as you say, Stephen, would find it quite easy to find uh, an older home, maybe around North Melbourne or Carlton somewhere, and you have four or five uh, young students living together for 100 bucks a week. It's just not possible anymore. 
and it's uh, it's becoming uh, really stressful for people that want to be living close to where they uh, go to, go to uni or uh, where they're working um, and to where services are as well. And in the regions, I, I think too, it's been interesting to see the the difference between what uh, some of the bigger regional cities were able to uh, be charging for rent, say five years ago, compared to now, and. I think that COVID's had a, had a definite impact there. We've had more people that have decided not to live in a share house or, or that have taken advantage of the fact that they can work a few days uh, a week from home, which means that they have uh, moved to regional areas as well. So we've got a, a real uh, change in the mix of people that are living in some of the regional areas. And I, I think too, the impact that Airbnb is having on the rental market industry, uh, the, on the entire rental industry, I don't think that that could be underestimated. And it was interesting to see that even the, the founder and CEO of Airbnb said that what Airbnb is today is so far removed mm. from what it was when it first started, when it used to be you know, advertising your spare room. Or if you went overseas, you could sublet for a couple of weeks, whereas now there are properties that are owned purely for that purpose to be rented out uh, as an Airbnb. And quite often in regional areas, you, know, you have a look at somewhere in Ballarat, you can um, have your property on Airbnb and rent it out for $400 a night, as opposed to you know, five, 550 a week um, as, as a private rental. And for any losses that you make on that, you can negatively gear it. Um, you know, I've heard, of, heard uh, anecdotally of cases where people that live around inner Melbourne, they'll have a second property down on the surf coast somewhere. They'll pay the mortgage for a year based on what the takings are over the summer holiday period. And then they can just, you know, go and use that property at their own discretion whenever they want. So we're in a situation now where uh, not only are people able to negatively gear their investment property, they can essentially negatively gear their own holiday home and put it out on Airbnb and make some money off it at the same time, which is just ridiculous. So, you know, for renters, um, renters are are, are feeling a a tougher squeeze than ever before. Um, And at the same time, taxpayers are subsidising that. So I, I think that the point where we are at with the rental market uh, right now really needs some urgent change. Um, so Matt, I'll get you to jump in on that in a moment. Just some re- quick reflections on there. The, the, the remarks you made about Airbnb. I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested that you did say that, Rebecca, about what the original founder, because he is from San Francisco and his whole idea was come, was built upon, you know, he was staying with some mates uh, and mm. they were just leasing out the spare room. And he said, oh, this is a good idea because a lot of people come in to SF for conferences and whatnot. So that's where the idea first came apart. And you, now San Francisco's housing is, it's a disaster. Like the housing property in San yes. Francisco is insane. Uh, and the second point about renting, uh, I remember I lived in a, uh, a rental property in um, North Fitzroy and it was a dump and my family dubbed it the hovel. Anyway, as an aside, uh, Matt, to you, did you live in a hovel? I lived in a few hovels in my time, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I, I've had a few few goes at the hovels. Um, on that Airbnb point, it's interesting to hear what um, Airbnb themselves say about Australia. So the CEO of Airbnb Australia New Zealand said that Australia is the most penetrated market for Airbnb in the world. You know, we have allowed this sort of new Leviathan to grow up. We've got no real national or state-based guidance, very little state-based guidance. So we're really leaving it up to local councils to try and figure out how to deal with this new, you know, enormous use of private dwellings. Um, the research that we're doing into Airbnb at the moment show that, you know, in some places on the surf coast near Melbourne, we're talking like over 20% of the housing stock are listed on Airbnb. And that's only Airbnb. You've got stays and the other ones as well. And, you know, while some of those would have been holiday homes that you'd have to ring up a local agent for back in the old mm. days before the internet, there is a, it is a totally different beast to what we assumed or thought Airbnb might be, which was actually the idea was to increase the efficiency of household mm. stock use, right? Like to fill up that spare bedroom to make housing more efficient. And instead we're making it way less efficient by making it compete with private rentals in the long-term private rental sector. Um, so there is a big issue that we need to grapple with there. Um, yeah. and and it's not necessarily... we... Sorry, go on. I just, just wanted to say that it's not necessarily a bad thing for there to be, uh, you know, rental properties that are available for short-term accommodation. It's just that we're in this incredibly unfair system where uh, private landlords have got no real incentive to be offering to the private rental market over short stay. Yeah. 
we, we incentivize the, the private rental market in many wrong ways, probably mostly in the wrong way. You know, for example, if we were to talk about capital gains tax, we allow people to get a discount on the capital gains tax on an investment property after one year. So that just encourages people to flip their house as quick as possible. If we were to say you, you get a CGT discount, but it's got to wait for five years or 10 years, that would make people think twice about becoming a landlord and it would mm. make the stability of our rental stock that much better. And one thing we haven't discussed, I suppose, is the social housing um, situation. And, you know, it's one of the most obvious areas of government failure, I think, over the last mm. 30 years or so, is that we've seen this huge slide. So back in the 80s, one in four renters was in social housing. And now we're down into less than one in 10 renters. And so we've just allowed um, this huge chunk of the population who used to be subsidized and have wraparound services within their accommodation have to go into the private rental market, compete with people with higher incomes. And also they've got landlords who've got no training or ability to deal with their, with their needs as well. So low income renters often have associated wraparound needs that you get in community housing. So mm. in terms of where we are, you know, in terms of the underfunding, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of social housing stock that we're short for um, and waiting lists that are in the 10 year sort of category for many parts of New South Wales and Victoria. 10 years, you know, so you, you apply with your one year old, two year old, and by the time you get your social housing, they're off to high school. You know, it's a totally different, it's, it's quite an insane situation for one of the richest countries in the world to not Absolutely. be able to provide housing for our least um, mm. able to afford it. Matt, while I've got you there, can I get a clarification on the difference between social housing and affordable housing? Well, yeah, it's um, kind of, uh, it's not, I don't think there's a pure definition at the moment, but social housing tends to be either public or community housing. Public housing, you pay this government run and that's, you pay no more than 25% of your income on the rent. Social housing's got similar, but not quite the same rules. And then affordable really, you know, it depends on who you ask, but below 20% below the market rate is often quoted as being affordable. But of course, you know, the, the median market rate, but of course that is still unaffordable for a whole bunch of people that are in the below median incomes. And particularly the people on job seeker or other, you know, government benefit schemes where their purchasing power of their uh, benefits has been declining dramatically for what, like four decades now. Let's talk about the cause. And I want to, um, get a sense of how the hell we got here. And I'm sure there are a multitude of public policy failures, uh, intervention by uh, the market, um, consumer behaviour, a whole bunch of different things. But Rebecca, what are some of the factors over the last couple of decades that have led to this crisis? Yes, I think that there are so many different factors when it comes to uh, the construction of, of homes, home ownership, and also the impacts on the, the property market. Even you know the fact we talk about housing supply, that one word supply has got so many different factors that uh, that really brought us to this to this dreadful point. In terms of rentals, I think that having a look at what has happened with negative gearing over the decades. Um, the way that there have been moves in the past to try and shift that uh, so that the market's starting to work back in favour of, of renters at the moment. Um, the, the fact that negative gearing has just been allowed to get uh, out of control, um, that's had a, a massive impact on renters, but also on the way that our property market itself is structured. So we're now in a situation where you know, almost 90% of Australia's rental properties are owned by private landlords. And so we, we need a really big disruptor in that market for there to be any sort of shift in that. And it's been uh, good to see moves from uh, the Albanese government as well to be encouraging things like uh, institutional investment into build, a rent, build to rent accommodation. Because, you know, overseas you have a look at uh, a lot of European countries and you have more of that institutionally owned uh, housing that is rented uh, or public housing as well. And they've been uh, both at a, a state and federal level, uh, a lot of underfunding when it comes to social housing. And the, the fact that the Andrews government uh, announced a $5 billion big build package for social housing. And even once all of that comes online, it's only going to make a, a dent in the numbers that Matt was talking about in terms of waiting lists. And I think in terms of things like uh, home ownership, the, the fact that uh, we're in a situation where uh, there have been some short 
term sugar hits given to people wanting to get in the market in the forms of uh, first home buyer grants rather than broader systemic change to getting more people into the property market. I think over time that's had quite a negative impact. And that's not to say that they that those sorts of measures uh, sorts of me- measures should be scrapped entirely. I think it is it's been uh, quite good to see in regional areas the fact that a first home buyer can um, get a stamp duty uh, incentive on a new build in terms of encouraging construction. But you know, gone are the days where it's acceptable for governments to be giving first home buyers um, a quick leg up into the market because it just lifts prices across the board. Mm. Matt, do you want to build on that in terms of some of the public policy failures that you can consider over the number? Of, I mean, you said in your opening remarks that this has been a problem that's been developing over you know number of decades. What else did you want yeah. to sort of highlight that's led us to this stage? Yeah, part of it is really a very broad, um, almost cultural or political culture of we used to accept that it was the government's role to build houses, whether it was the Menzies government building cheap. Uh, houses for owner occupiers to buy, whether it was Labor governments building public housing, there was a pretty broad consensus that the market doesn't operate well, particularly for lower end, the lower end of the market. The private sector doesn't provide housing at cost um, for lower income households. And so after the Second World War, we were, our governments decided, you know, and this is bilaterally really, that we would build, you know, between, I think the average was about 15,000 homes a year were built by government between 1945 and 1970. So at some time, at some points during that period, government was building 20% of all homes in, in construction rates. So an enormous role for government that we've basically abandoned. And now government, our, you know, our public housing or social housing stock is barely keeping up with the numbers where we where we were 20 or 10 years ago. And populations exploded since then. So having that kind of losing that kind of um, policy architecture that okay. It's A, a government responsibility. It's B, federal government's responsibility to figure out the funding of a lot of this and see we're going to set targets and actually do it. Um, you know, we've lost that kind of policy framework. And, mm. and if I was to say to you, what's the housing budget? If, if you say to a housing expert, what's the federal housing budget? Nobody knows. It's like distributed through all these different areas of different budgets. It's not treated as a policy area. So even just treating it as a, a unified policy area is kind of the start. That's what we need to get back to and say, it's in the national interest that we fix this policy failure. It's a really complicated and difficult policy domain because it's everything from RBA rent increases through to whether your neighbor gets to build a balcony and overlooking your backyard. It's incredibly complicated and that's exactly the reason why we need to have a centralized federal government lead on this. And so hopefully with Homes Australia, you know, with this changing government, we're gonna see a bit more of that uh, come into, into train. Rebecca, there was a- also, there's always a lot of conversation about the lack of quality control in construction um, and, you know, builders and developers get a bad rap um, on this sort of stuff, um, doing a lot of work that's below industry standard. You hear all these sort of stories of, you know, um, I know under the, in Victoria here, under the um, Liberal, the previous Liberal government, it, albeit they were in for 20 minutes, but Matt Guy, when he was a playing minister, you, can only, you just look at Elizabeth Street in the city now, there's like nine or ten skyscraper housing is uh, sort of high density accommodation and apparently you know the, the rooms in there are mm. tiny 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 um what do you what's your take on the role that the private sector has played in fueling a lot of the challenges that uh the, the community who want to either buy a house or rent a home uh, a strike are, are facing right now it's really complex in terms of the rules that that govern uh, construction and also just the planning rules that govern what you can actually build as well as as Matt said everything to do with this is incredibly layered and complex when we talk about some of those uh, apartment buildings that we saw crop up uh, in the city when uh, we had so many um, skyscraper approvals from uh, Matthew Guy uh, around you know 2013 2014 the the result was, uh, you know, bedrooms that didn't have their own light source. There were no um, storage requirements. So then you have people that are putting their belongings out on balconies. The uh, balconies get uh, cluttered up and then you have, you know, external um, air conditioning units that are catching on fire. Or, uh, you know, I saw a report once where uh, in the stairwells and where the uh, fire hose rails are kept, people are keeping their stuff in there because there's no storage in the apartments. And, you know, the the with 
without having any sort of requirements in place for how an apartment is is meant to be built, then you have uh, D- Victoria was very quickly becoming a destination um, for really cheap investment particularly from people that weren't looking to put their property in the rental market, but just to park their money in a safe haven like Victoria and buying an apartment was akin to buying a gold bullion. Um, And I remember too that when the previous planning minister, Richard Wynne, when he introduced those standards for the apartment market, uh, he was heavily criticised for increasing the cost of housing. But how good is is a house, is that roof over your head when it's leaking from the inside. It might uh, have a combustible cladding fire when there is no storage or you've got uh, mould because the, the quality of the build just isn't very good. Um, I think, I think too, talking about where we're at with building standards as well, I think that across the country we are still living with the impacts of the, the fact that you know, there was this big trend uh, in the 90s and early 2000s to privatise the building uh, surveyor industry and by doing that, we've you know removed an entire uh, layer of scrutiny, and I think that until there is some really big shifts in the way that the building industry is regulated, that's something that uh, we're all going to continue living with. Uh, Matt, uh, Rebecca just touched on a couple of anecdotal experiences for renters um, that that, um, that have come about because of some of these um, you know poor planning um, regulations or lack of. Got, want to get a sense from you in terms of your research that you've unearthed. Uh, with respect to the impacts that this has had on the community, whether it be renters or people trying to get into the housing market or people still in the housing market and dealing with skyrocketing interest rates? Mm. Yeah, so we did a survey of nearly 5,000 people um, in December last year. So in the midst of the rate hike cycle, not at the very peak, but we're still getting a sense of you know how people are dealing with the increase in rents and increase in mortgage costs. So for around 76% of um, renters who want to own their own home, um, they just think that, don't think they're going to be able to do it without a major uh, injection of cash from the from the bank of mum and dad. So really, what we're seeing is this kind of uh, this intergenerational um, asset based wealth uh, difference between you know renters who have got parents with cash and those without. There's a big shift in which of those people think they're going to actually enter the housing market. Um, interestingly, even for homeowners, so forty percent of homeowners say. Um, that they're benefiting from the current housing market or the housing system, meaning that 60% of the population that own a house don't think that they're doing well out of the situation, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. I think most of us follow that line um, from John Howard that, you know, I've never heard a homeowner complain about my house price going up. But actually, most people that we spoke to, so about 70% of the population think that the current housing system is unsustainable and it's causing economic and social damage. So it's really interesting to see how the population actually leading, um, they're ahead of the political debate in many ways. So we, we asked people about what they want to do about the situation. Over 70% of the population want to see a, a big increase in public housing expenditure. Two thirds of the population want to in, um, explore the idea of rent controls. Um, even investors, you know, people with a, a single investment property, over half of them were in favor of rent controls as well. So we've got, <laughs> Um, a population that's definitely feeling the pinch pretty hard and they see the inequity in the current system. And they're, I think they're ahead of, of all the parties really when it comes to finding policy solutions. Rebecca, I'm interested to get a sense from you in terms of uh, the impacts this, this has on women as well. I mean, there must be sort of a gender inequality into housing uh, accessibility as well, right? There is, and it's something that uh, doesn't seem to improve uh, over time either. So already uh, women are worse off when it comes to uh, superannuation at the end of their careers uh, compared to men, and that's something that also spills over into housing ownership as well. So quite often too, uh, women have... uh, a lot of financial difficulties later on in life as well, particularly uh, if their relationship ends as well, if they've raised children too. And there have been some you know, really troubling stats uh, around uh, the amount of women that stay in dangerous relationships far longer than they would if they had other options when it comes to um, getting um, some, some secure housing for themselves and also from their kids too. Um, so it's, it's really troubling to consider, you know, when we're we're talking uh, uh, about housing um, 
housing tends to be something that people treat as wealth creation, but when you think of it as, as a human right and as something that has such significant social outcomes, we really need to be putting that wealth argument to one side and, and having a look at the fact that, um, that women and a lot of other vulnerable people as well um, are still working uh, full time and, um, and are really vulnerable when it comes to keeping a roof over their heads. Uh, Matt, any other research that uh, you guys have unco- uncovered in terms of the, some of the the, uh, the impacts on women that uh, Rebecca's talking about? Yeah, so on Rebecca's point about staying with staying with partners, um, we asked the question um, whether you, people have put off leaving a partner because of housing costs associated with leaving, and we found that over twenty percent of lower middle income women under forty had said that they had delayed leaving a partner because of the cost of moving out, right? So really significant um, impact there. And I think what we have is like a, uh, a combination of several factors. So women have got the gender payback gap to deal with. They might be out of work, child rearing and have no income at all. Um, they've got a super gap. And then we've uncovered that there's also what we're calling the gift gap, which is that um, the bank of mum and dad is not an equal opportunities lender, it turns out. So we asked, um, did you get um, financial assistance to buy your first home? And men were about 50% more likely to report receiving financial assistance from the bank of mum and dad than women. So obviously, uh, we, we couldn't figure out a, a, uh, an absolute answer on this, and we're sort of picking through why it might be. One of the ideas is that, you know, in our culture, in Western culture, the, um, the parents of the bride pay for the marriage. So it might be the parents think, okay, well, I've, I've given 20 grand to my daughter for her wedding day and uh, we'll give 20 grand to the son to buy a house. Um, obviously, you know, the son's at the wedding drinking the champagne and eating the canapes and that all of that pile of money that the daughter gets gets consumed in one day, whereas the, the home deposit um, gets built upon um, year after year. So really significant differences. And it's not just in that area, it's, it's, it's across the rental, social housing and owner occupancy. So women are less likely to own in our survey, about 5% less likely and about 10% less likely to own an investment property. So all those overly generous um, provisions that we have, like negative gearing and capital gains discounting, it's funneled up to the top income brackets and it's funneled up more to men than to women. Social housing, that we've seen a huge decline in spending from federal and state governments, women are more likely to need crisis and social housing. than men. So while we're taking away from social housing and giving to the top end, we're effectively taking from women to give to men. The uh, other group I wanted to talk about is the um, the, la- the evil landlords and the dodgy real estate agents. Are they victims at all of this as well? Because obviously there's a, there's a narrative within the sort of the broader, uh, I guess, media landscape uh, about this community. Uh, Rebecca, is this conflated? Is it is it as bad as, or as widespread as we think it is, or are they mis, un, mis, misunderstood? Oh, the poor landlords, Stephen. Oh, I, I think that you know it, it goes back to what I said a moment ago about uh, this culture of using property in Australia to to build wealth. And so there uh, have been people that have really set it as a as a goal for themselves that even if they aren't necessarily high income earners, to be able to you know uh, buy an investment property to help. Um, them save for their own superannuation or to help um, kickstart uh, their, their uh, children's um, wealth portfolios as well. Um, we also you know, live in a country where we've got superannuation that was designed to provide for people in old age that is now also a vehicle for people to own extra properties as well. So I, th- I think that it's not necessarily individuals, but this culture that we've created um, around um, owning properties for other people to live in purely to be um, accumulating more than anything else. It was interesting to see uh, the age renter story this week, I can't recall the headline, but it was something along the lines of, you know, landlords are real people just like you. And, I saw that. Uh, I was, I was re- reading the piece to try and find some evidence of, of who had commissioned either uh, you know, a research piece or if it was an op-ed. And uh, it wasn't until today when there was a correction made that uh, one of the voices in that story was representing um, a landlord group. And you know, landlords have been very well uh, represented when it comes to uh, political decisions around negative gearing, and uh, and and putting that that pressure when it comes to political decision making about removing negative gearing as well. Um, I, I think too, 
you know, so long as we live in an environment where the bulk of rental properties are owned by private investors, um, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, make a difference whether or not some are lovely and want to look after homes and look after the people that live in them. And if some just want to squeeze as many dollars as they can without, you know, fixing things that that is uh, that is broken. So long as we've got um, one type of investor owning the majority of properties, we're always going to have these sorts of problems. And, you know, if we can have an increase in the amount of uh, institutions that are owning rental properties and more public housing available as well, that will finally start to tip things back in favour of, uh, of renters. Let's take a quick break to talk about SwiftFox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust. Lists that are up to date, absolutely. Phone banks uh, that can change minds. Emails that drive donations and events that will energise the community online and offline. And text blasts that distill your message perfectly. SwiftFox CRM is made for campaigners by campaigners. And to find out more, go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign. Okay, let's get back to the show. One thing that's fascinated me, and just listening to your response there, um, Rebecca, I, I can't help but think I, was, I had this question earlier on, but I was going to, I was going to junk it, but I might bring it in. Is it, a, is it just an Australian thing? My, my cousins who I think sporadically listen to this podcast, hello, Brian and Nora, uh, in Glasgow and Scotland, they own their home. They've owned their home for a long, long time. They have no desire to own another home. You know, uh, I think it's quite easy for, not easy, sorry, reframe that. People living in the middle, middle class, certainly in, their communities own their home and outright, like they've paid it off from the bank. Um, and even last year, if I was over in Europe for work and I just sort of had a bit of a sticky beak at some of the, you know, price when you walk past it, a, a real estate agent in some of these cities in Western Europe, looking at the prices of some of the apartments, which in my brain, I'd look around going, this is a nice area. These must be insanely expensive weren't that bad i mean they weren't cheap right but they were i was like oh okay and i sort of worked out what the you know medium income is for someone in that country and i was like oh that's attainable right what's happened in this country where we've has someone just sort of created a like this sort of i've cracked the code and so uh, these accountants have said to all of their clients just go out and accumulate as much property as you possibly can i mean is it have we set ourselves up to fail that put us in the situation in the first place culturally in this country i don't know i just i don't know who wants to take a stab at that first maybe matt i'd be happy to have a crack yeah um yeah i think it's partly that it's partly that we become a victim of our own success okay so before world war ii fewer than half of the population owned a home after the second war we were like okay we're going to make sure everyone in this country can afford to buy a house it's going to be the australian dream this is how we're going to run the show from now on and so we increased uh, property ownership up to 70% really quickly, incredibly quickly. And that was maintained through to the well, the 80s or so. And then in the, in the 90s, we started introducing these ridiculous tax changes um, like capital gains tax and negative gearing. And so anyone with that housing asset was suddenly massively advantaged over new buyers, right? Like if you've got that housing wealth in your pocket, you can go to the bank and say, oh, here's my deposit. Um, I will uh, buy an investment property, I'll negatively gear it, thank you very much, and I'll flip it in a couple of years. Um, and so we've just set this train in motion. Mm. So just to give you an idea of the scale of like increase in house prices, the, the entire housing stock of Australia used to be about two times GDP back in the 80s, uh, back in the 90s, sorry. And now it's four and a half times GDP, right? We're up to $10 trillion. It's insane. And obviously incomes have not kept up in any way, shape or form which means that capital is always going to have uh, an advantage over uh, income. And then you've got the negative gearing and the, and the capital gains tax discount on top of that. So we just built in this idea that you know, like you'd be an idiot if you had some spare cash. You'd be an idiot not to invest in an investment property right now. There's no better place to put your money to have growth in your capital assets. So we've got that. And then there is the culture. Clearly, there is a culture of property like the word property is used here more than i've ever heard i've lived in a few different countries mm -hmm. people say the word property so much here uh, instead of house or home and i find that really telling i think that's quite telling is that we've got this idea that it's mine it's definitely mine and it's not the it's not the renters it's not their home it's my property and that's mm -hmm. sort of framed why we've got like no fault evictions is still the norm across the country like there's a few states that have outlawed no fault evictions 
But in most of the country, if you don't want your tenant, you just turf them out like it's the Middle Ages, you know? It's completely insane. Um, so there is cultural elements, but also this idea that we built this huge volume of wealth at the household level and then unleashed it through negative gearing and capital gains tax discount into the investment market. It's been a total policy failure. Maybe we should take something from uh, Daryl Kerrigan and refer to all of our homes as our castle instead. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the solutions. We're at the halfway mark and I, I, we're a solutions oriented podcast and I want to come up with some solutions. So I'm looking, going to lean heavily on the, the two of you. I, uh, sarcastically note that uh, Philip Lowe, the the governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, has come up with a solution, which is um, that uh, more people should um, house share, stay at home or work more. And I note that he earns $911,000 per year base rate. I don't know if that's the solution. Um, we talked earlier on about inflation, increased interest rates, impacting the capacity to find and keep a secure, uh, secure home. This can't be uh, – Matt, I want to turn to you first. The, the, the inflation increases, I get that the economy is, you know, was overheating. They wanted to sort of put a, a dampener on that. But just the – this can't be a solution that we turn to. And, Rebecca, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago as well when we were on the show about the um, – when we were talking about interest rates, when we were talking about the Victorian budget. But to you, Matt, um, is this exacerbating the problem? Yeah, and, and it's a, there's a weird feedback loop now, which is that you increase interest rates, that pushes up landlords mortgages and that pushes up rent prices which pushes up inflation so there's a bit of circularity in the system mm. i think what we've seen is that um you know back in the 90s people would be able to eat a 15 percent interest rate um because the the value of their debt was so much lower compared to their income and now we've got this huge ballooning household debt that's just savaging people even with quite small interest rate rises so the the um, effect is much bigger on households and let's, let's go back and talk about why we raise interest rates. The purpose, you know, according to the RBA, is to slow, it's not to slow consumption. The idea was to slow investment from capitalists to reduce the number of new jobs going into the system. That's the model they're working from. But actually, that's not happening at all. What's happening is that we're smashing the consumption side of the equation. Mm. And that's just, you know, it's what we're sacrificing is, is real people's level of uh, standard of living. Um, for something that probably isn't their fault at all. It's probably mostly imported uh, rate, uh, increased costs through supply chain problems, the war in Ukraine and so on. So it's a terrible lever, but it's the only one he's got. And yeah, I guess uh, for, for Philip Lowe, you know, it's very easy for him to say those slightly tone deaf statements. There is a grain of truth in that, right? Like, um, like Re Rebecca was saying, under COVID times, especially in Melbourne, um, we spread out quite a lot. A lot of um, multiple occupancy homes split into single occupancy homes. So there will be a retightening, reformation of those dwellings, and that will like cool off those ridiculously tight um, um, rental availability rates. Um, but yeah, clearly we shouldn't be smashing people with interest rate rises um, if the purpose is to reduce economic productivity. You know, if we're trying to reduce consumption, then that's clearly what we're doing. But that's not mm. the, the goal of the RPA. Mm. Rebecca, so, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, go, Rebecca, uh, please. Yeah. I was just thinking about what's what we started to see uh, this time 10 years ago when interest rates uh, started to be cut for those reasons that, that Matt was uh, speaking about and the impact that had on the property market. That really supercharged buying power, uh, particularly for people that already owned their own home. So they were able to use the equity to go and buy an investment property. And so that's, we had this uh, this environment where we started hearing more and more about young people in the market to buy their first home are uh, getting absolutely pummeled at auctions from uh, from older people that were able to buy uh, another property. And, you know, that started, really started to shine through in the clearance rates here in uh, here in Melbourne, but also in New South Wales and in Sydney, where auctions hadn't been as popular as what they were down here. The market was heating up so much that we really saw a shift in Sydney towards more homes going under the hammer when they were sold as well. And so, you know, suddenly we've got more homes that are, that are being uh, snapped up at a higher rate because of those lower interest rates. So then naturally, once those interest rates start going up, well, who's going to be paying for those, those uh, interest rate rises? So it's um it's been interesting to see uh, just how everything that happened ten years ago in terms of the um, changes to interest rates how that's then um, almost fallen back in on itself again uh, a decade later and I think that there were 
people watching the market at the time that did flag that as being an impact. But when you have uh, all, all of a sudden, when your bank is selling you cheaper money to go and buy another home um, as a way to, uh, to grow your own wealth, it was very attractive for a lot of people. And so I, I just think that it's it's uh, comes back to what we were saying before about landlords. Are they necessarily, uh, you know, evil people wanting to do the wrong thing? I think it's it's more about having a broader look at some of the impacts that um, uh, that our housing market has had on on people rather than individual behaviour. So, I mean, what do we do there? How, how, do, how does government intervene? Do they try and create a deterrent so people stop doing that so it's not as sexy to then go and invest their, you know, their savings into a second home? I think, first of all, we need to scrap negative gearing for short-term uh, accommodation. And I think that we are in an environment now where there is a lot of political capital for that sort of change as well, um, perhaps in a way that there wasn't when uh, Bill Shorten took uh, negative gearing changes to the 2019 election. Um, I think the the way that people are feeling about the property market now when it comes to people buying more homes and building more wealth when so many people are are worse off. It's it's a time for governments, state and federally, to show real leadership, and uh, and not just tinker around the edges, but have a look at uh, at new homes and how they come onto the market, um, and how our rental market is structured, and have a look at, at you know really uh, really big systemic change that can have a much longer term impact. Otherwise, we're just going to con- we're just going to be uh, playing catch up, and the problem's only going to get worse. I mean, right now, every uh, dollar that the government is spending uh, on social housing is, you know, it's not not even, it's not even enough to be replacing uh, the older stock that's there mm. that is, you know, uh, old and needs a lot of repairs and, uh, and, and needs to be replaced. So, you know, f- so long as governments are keep on pushing this problem to the side uh, and ignoring um, the growing chorus of voters that want real action here, um, the worse the problem is going to come. Matt, did you want to build on those uh, reflections from uh, Rebecca? Yeah, just I guess one thing to finish out on the interest rate issue, and then and then some more of the solution side of things. But with interest rates, you know, one of the things that's quite unique to Australia is that nearly everyone has a variable rate mortgage. It's like eighty five percent of the population, or pre COVID, it was, and that means that all of the rate rises that the RBA, RBA introduces get passed straight through to consumer. So if you look at someone like the US. The most common mortgage is a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, right? So you are broadly insulated from these effects. So for the, the RBA can operate, sorry, the central bank can operate an interest rate policy that, you know, tries to cool the market or whatever they think they're doing um, without smashing householders in the same way that we're seeing here. So one thing is, is this issue that we just don't have that option. And um, in, in most of uh, Western Europe as well, you, know, you have a far higher proportion of people with fixed rate mortgage. So that's one of the elements. But as Rebecca said, you know, we, we can either keep, keep kicking this can down the road or grab the bull by the horns. And it feels like now is a really politically opportune moment, right? Like we've got quite a uh, resurgent um, Labour federal state government uh, control, uh, which is, you know, it's been quite unusual for a while. And we have, on housing, the main opposition seems to be coming from the Greens rather than from the Liberals. And they're pushing for more, you know, what they see as more radical solutions. Um, so it does seem like an opportune moment now to really be do, making those big systemic reforms. On the tax side, yeah, getting scrapping negative gearing in certain circumstances. Um, with the capital gains discount, maybe you say, okay, you can get your CGT discount after 10 years, and that will encouraged long-term patient capital into the rental market to avoid people getting turfed out every year. You know, because when, when people get turfed out of their rental property, the cost of moving, let's say five, six, seven hundred bucks for a low-income household, that's an enormous cost to eat. And we just seem to accept that as, as normal for some reason. So we've got to rebuild our social housing stock. We have to um, try and tame this uh, hobby landlord market, you know, 75% of landlords own a single investment property. Uh, that is not sustainable into the future. We, we really need to get more build to rent options coming in. And I think we're seeing some policy levers being introduced by the Albanese and um, in Victoria, the state government as well, um, some policy levers there to encourage through tax incentives, more build to rent. The uh, I want to talk about 
urban sprawl um, and the s- supply side of housing. Rebecca, um, I feel like in some of the circles that we operate in, um, in a city, elites that we are, uh, that the term medium housing and high density housing is a dirty word. Yet, if you look at cities like New York or Boston, Copenhagen, Barcelona, Tokyo, they've all got a lot of medium and high density housing. Um, and I'm not saying these are perfect solutions, but um, surely we, I mean, I heard the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, say in the last couple of weeks that that the government wants to see more home dwellings be built in existing established areas, both in a city and that sort of me- medium ring, I guess, of of um, metropolitan and Melbourne. <laughs> um, mm. Bless you. Um, what's your thoughts on on this idea of medium and, and high density housing? Because it, you know, the sort of the boomers that live in well to do suburbs like Fitzroy and Collingwood are obviously vehemently opposed to this kind of stuff, but um, this has to be something that we need to consider and kind of push back on that on that argument, right? Absolutely. I've got a lot of thoughts on this. I think, too, that uh, it's been really interesting to see the rise in a real YIMBY movement, so as opposed to that not-in-my-backyard movement that's always been quite loud and vocal, particularly around the inner suburbs. We're starting to see the flip side of that, and that's the yes in my backyard. And having a look at a lot of the opposition to infill development it's tended to be uh, some of the louder voices too and the people that really start to mobilize and organize and it's been quite unfortunate that we've seen uh, inner suburban um, community groups that have really kick-started off the grounds that they don't want to see the the suburb change because they don't want that infill development Um, there are you know a a number of reasons why people uh, don't don't want to see infill development happen Um, I think that it's it's good to hear the Premier put that view out there in terms of making sure that people are starting to think about their their own suburbs as being part of the solution um, rather than continuously wanting to get involved in fights against property developers because it's not pri- fights against property developers, it's fights, it's a fight against affordability. And I, I think that some of those examples that you mentioned, Stephen, around uh, medium density uh, in places like uh, Boston, Copenhagen, there are some really good examples of, uh, of medium density development uh, around Melbourne. Uh, I mean, we've got some great examples around uh, where I live, around North Melbourne and Kensington, um, and it's been done by uh, developers that are taking a, a much longer term view um, in terms of how they are how they are building. Um, I think that you know big projects that the government's doing, things like the suburban rail loop. Um, that's just full of opportunities for uh, for doing infrastructure development while piggybacking um, infill uh, on that as well. And there have been some other countries that have done a really good job of making sure that um, new services are delivered at the same time as those big infrastructure projects uh, are delivered um, while also having a funding stream for them as well. So when uh, when London built Crossrail and they, they put a levy on the commercial properties, um, uh, which meant that they had had a revenue stream based on the fact that land incomes uh, were really rising um, where the new railway line was being built. When you think about, you know, the opportunities for infill that that we have here in Melbourne, uh, you know, Fisherman's Bend is a really good example. If there had been uh, value capture levies applied to that when Matthew Guy rezoned all of that land, the amount of uh, the amount of services. Um, and, you know, community facilities that, that could have been built there would mean that um, not only would you have uh, that funding stream, you would have far greater public support for medium density housing because a lot of the time people, they don't necessarily oppose apartments being built. They just don't like the idea of uh, of their schools being overcrowded or not being able to get in to see their GP. Um, it's, it's a lot more than just the development uh, itself. I do wonder yeah, about absolutely. that if the I speak to someone in the Department of Planning um, at, at, actually at a social event, so it wasn't exactly a formal conversation, but I said to them, do you guys have like a ratio of when if you're going to enable more dwellings be built in a particular area, just say hypothetically it's like 4,000 new dwellings going in there, that uh, that you have a ratio that that means that there must be 
uh, new schools going in, be it primary or secondary or more healthcare or, or childcare uh, or like even things like a Woolies going in uh, or God forbid, a really good quality coffee shop because that would send everyone spare. Um, like do they do that in their planning when they sit down with, you know, either um, private private developers or, or other parts of the government agency and they said, no, that we don't really do that. I just don't understand why. Like why would you just allow someone just to build all of this sort of stuff and then not factor in the other things that the community need? Uh, otherwise, it, that's how we sort of start to develop, um, you know, ghettos, I guess, where these people live in these homes but don't leave them because there's nothing to do. Um, I want to get your thoughts, uh, Matt, on the idea of the benefits of but also the things we need to be aware of in terms of um, medium and, and high density um, dwellings. Yeah, and there's a few um, examples around like, on the outskirts of the city where developers have been able to rezone uh, agricultural land, stuff in a few thousand homes, no childcare, no medical centre, no pharmacy, no milk bar, nothing, uh, and no even road access. That's, I can't remember the name of the place now. There's one community. Was it Tarnay? They're stuck to it. They do, they'll have to do a half an hour trip backwards before they can get to a highway intersection to come back into the city because the intersection wasn't built. Yeah. Um, you know, terrible, terrible planning outlays. And I guess one of the benefits of um, infill development is that obviously that uh, a lot of those facilities are already there and can be upscaled. The other is, yeah, if you um, rezone an area of land, you can push some of those costs onto the developers. So this idea, so at the moment, the Victorian government has got an inclusionary zoning pilot study underway. And that, what that involves is when they rezone some land next to the suburban rail loop, for example, um, they will say to a developer, all right, this is now, uh, we've changed this from commercial to residential. The land value will increase from X to Y number of dollars. Um, for us giving you the rights to build in this place, you have to have, let's say, 15, 20% of all the dwellings in that property have to be either social housing or uh, affordable housing, whatever the targets might be. It's not, it's not public yet from the Victorian um, pilot scheme, but that sort of operation is a really good way of um, forcing some of the social housing costs or the affordable housing costs back onto developers. And it, I think ideally what that will do is actually bring down land values because what you're saying is, yeah, land value is going to go up, but we're creaming a certain proportion off for the, for the citizens of Melbourne. Um, and that should sh suppress land value prices because that's what we've seen that's the problem at the moment is, you know, so much, so much of the problems that we see across rental, homeowner and social is that land values have just grown out of whack with mm. all sort of use um, value. So, yeah, I think there's a real opportunity there for us to to build on our what we already have as assets as a city. Uh, Rebecca, to you, I yeah. mean, the, th the things that um, Matt's just talked about there, that 10, 15%, I see the, uh, sorry, 20%, I see the Greens are calling on that needs to be 50%. I mean, is that, is that economically feasible? I don't really see um, how it how it is, but I guess too that that's also um, what works in favour for the Greens is that they wouldn't actually have to deliver on that. Uh, and if that was to happen, then they would be able to take credit for it. And for any government that didn't do that, well, then they would be uh, vulnerable to the Greens' criticism. So it's kind of a moot point um, in in a lot of ways. But I I think um, I was just thinking about what Matt was talking about in the context of how uh, some of those inclusionary zoning measures, you know, some of the criticism that comes out against them in terms of what it does to the value of land. And I recall that that was a criticism when um, the Victorian government in conjunction with the City of Melbourne brought in the C270 provisions for the CBD. So that was for a developer, if they wanted to build beyond the plot ratio of the city, they had to offer something uh, back uh, in the interest of the, the broader public in exchange for going beyond the boundaries of the um, of the planning rules for a particular block. And I uh, I quite like that that approach because it means that there can be that negotiation between the state government and a council to do things like you know build an office tower, but you know have a childcare centre in there. And I think that it, it does work well too because it means that uh, that net benefit um, can be delivered at the same time that uh, a building is constructed as well. And you know there was uh, a, a lot of talk at the time around how you make that how you make that work in a way that uh, that is fair for the city and for the community but is also economically feasible as well um you know because the the uh the bare facts of it are that if it isn't 
uh, easy and profitable to be doing uh, development here, then we will have developers that go and uh, choose to build in other areas. And there will always be uh, that competition between the different capital cities as well around where is going to be um, the best the best place to do business. But I think we can also uh, counter that as well by making sure that when there are um, you know properties that have been proposed that offer a net benefit to the community, that they um, do have uh, access to a more streamlined planning process. And I know that the state governments uh, offered that for uh, for build to rent, and I think that there's uh, some opportunities for those sorts of provisions to be um, expanded as well, and for councils to get in on uh, on that action too, so that there are a, a lot of incentives in a market that is um, quite difficult for developers at the moment in terms of you know, su- supply chain. Um, costs um, and the access that they themselves have to finance um, and that people buying into their projects have in terms of their uh, access to finance too, that if we can make it as easy as possible for people to be building the things that our community needs, then we've got a much greater chance of actually getting them. Love it. Matt, you've uh, touched on earlier in the podcast some of the things that are coming out of the Albanese government in terms of solutions around this policy. Is there anything that you haven't covered off that we need to, you wanted to sort of flag with our uh, listeners? Um, so what we've got so far in terms of getting some of the old institutions from making decisions at that federal level back, we've had the National Supply and Affordability Council restored. We've had the establishment of Housing Australia, which is going to be the, hopefully going to be this new national peak housing agency. And we've, uh, the government's currently in the process of um, redesigning the National Housing and Homelessness Plan. Um, Dr. Chris Martin at UNSW has done a great job um, of writing um, how the NAHA, the National Housing Housing and Homelessness Agreement Plan, could be reshaped to sort of uh, be a guiding strategic long-term document, and that's really worth having a read of. Um, So I think those are the three sort of institutional changes. In terms of funding, obviously we've got the the potential for the half, um, but we've seen some other um, changes to... Um, community housing funding as well. So I guess really what we're seeing is, I hope what we're seeing is a sort of a winding up towards a big push on on housing from the government. Uh, Rebecca, to you, just to wrap up, the politics of this, the Greens have indicated that they're yet to um, agree to passing this in the in the Senate. Uh, any of the legislative changes that the Albanese government wants to bring in. I'm inter- interested to see how you think the Greens are going to walk both sides of the street in terms of their renter voter base versus the uh, those uh, inner city boomers that uh, own multiple properties voter base that mm. tend to vote for them as well. How's that going to play out for them? I th- think that it's inter- it's interesting the fact that they have chosen some uh, mechanisms that are predominantly in the wheelhouse of state governments when it comes to uh, the negotiating tools that they are using. And uh, it's also unfortunate too that the amount of time has passed that would uh, really allow the federal government to be able to get legislation over the line um, so that we could have the legislation that is needed for a proper housing accord in place this year. And so I don't know how, uh, whether, whether or not that's going to play out very well for the Greens uh, longer term, but but also to the, the fact that uh, regardless of, of the outcome, that that, that is uh, the political party that won't be held responsible uh, for it and, and isn't actually um, in the business of creating uh, legacy and, uh, and, and actually building um, new housing either. Um, I, I think that it's it's really unfortunate that that the housing crisis in general has been um, what, what's, what it's taken to really elevate um, housing and planning um, policy discussion as, as well. And I do wonder if perhaps it would be top of mind for the Greens if we weren't uh, at, at, this, at this crisis to be at the point where they're effectively um, holding what could be a really um, landmark federal government policy. It's effectively being held ransom right now, which is, which is really unfortunate. Um, I do think, though, that you know, broadly, well, well beyond the Greens, that, that Labor across all of the state governments and federally too, um, has got a massive opportunity here that I really hope that, that the uh, party grabs hold of um, with, with both hands because, you know, even if you don't take a particular housing policy to an election, when a Labor government is elected, there is that mandate there 
to do things like uh, provide for housing and make the housing market fairer for people as well. And here in Victoria, you know, the Andrews Labor government's got the strongest track record in terms of um, delivering social change, but also building as well. And so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, that those values um, are really what underpins future housing policy so that we can incorporate some of those social values into our housing policy. And when we do things like build uh, massive uh, major infrastructure projects, those social and housing outcomes um, form a much bigger part of the decision making. It's going to be uh, a wait and see, I guess, as these are policies, uh, particularly from the Victorian state government, uh, come uh, to light uh, and see how negotiations go through uh, the Senate in the coming uh, months. Uh, Matt, first of all, thank you very much for coming on the show for the first time. Really appreciate your insights. Good luck with the rest of the work you're doing at uh, Per Capita. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Good and chat. Rebecca, once again, thank you so much for coming back on the show and sharing your insights. Really appreciate your uh, time today. Oh, pleasure. Look, I think, Matt, that between us, we could probably uh, get the whole joint fixed pretty quickly. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Love it. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunstreet on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. Socially Democratic was brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Morris Blackburn Lawyers have spent more than a century paving the hard path to justice for everyday Australians. They've helped over 500,000 Australians turn their situation around and they know how the system works. Their experience and skills means you'll get the best results possible. Find out more on their website, morrisblackburn.com.au. Morris Blackburn, experience you can count on. Socially Democratic was brought to you by Swift Fox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust, lists that are up to date, phone banks that can change minds, emails that drive donations, events that will energise the community online and offline, and text blasts that distill your message perfectly swift fox crm is made for campaigners by campaigners to find out more go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign